Hello, this is the RPG Pundit, the final boss in internet shitlords. And before I begin today, I've got some very, very good news. So, I can tell you now that Baptism of Fire, I have a final PDF version of it. What that means is that all of the proofreading is done, all the layout, everything's ready. And uh, now that I've given it my, my check mark, it is going to be going, I assume, to do the printing proof for drive through RPG and for, for Amazon. And within a, uh, just a, a couple of weeks, I hope, two or three weeks, it should finally be available for sale. And it's going to be available in, in soft cover, hard cover. Um, regular and premium colored uh, paper and uh, you'll be able to get it as I said on Amazon or on drive through and of course on PDF so all of those options <laughs> that is very good news and it is a gorgeous looking book it looks really fantastic and I'm very happy with it so anyways that's that's the the newest news of the day but um, Today I thought I would go after, you know, a few weeks ago I did a video about the how to generate cults in Cults of Chaos and a lot of people are saying that they want to see stuff from the Gonzo Fantasy Companion doing that. And so like first let me point out about generators, right? So a generator is anything where you can use random elements to to create um, a to create a structure, right? Like one of the basic generators of of, of any RPG tends to be character creation if it isn't point by, right? Like the D&D, you're creating a character. You start with, no, there's no there's no factor, there's nothing there. Then you have to roll dice. And then you have to either select or roll up for a race, you know? And, and so the more random it is, the more that it is a a true generator, right? But but it, generators are allowed to give you options at different points. And, and especially in game design, the assumption should be that um, at any point, the person in charge, which is typically the DM, right, can can choose to say that you can ignore the result of a roll for something else. You know, in the case of of trying to make a generator that reflects what he wants it to look like in the world. Um, so, like Star Adventurer here doesn't have any of those kind of generators apart from character creation itself. Um, it, it uses something else. It uses a, a archetype. So instead of for when you're creating character races in Star Adventurer, um, instead of rolling up for weird ones, which is also a perfectly legitimate thing to, I think Machinations does that. And I mean, obviously, as you're about to see, the Gaunts of Fantasy Companion does that. So I'm definitely not against that. But what I decided to do, because it was meant to be space opera, was to use archetypes. Okay, so um, you have the alien that is like the smart alien. These aliens is the strong alien. The alien that's the like spacer, the alien that's the the technician. You know, the 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 one that likes to mess around with gadgets, right? You have the primitive alien, the the hunter alien, all kinds of stuff like that, right? And then you you can decide what they look like. The way they look like doesn't really matter in the context of space opera. What matters is um, what they're are what their stereotype is, right? What their archetype is. That's, that, that's the important part. Um, Sword and Caravan has a ton of generators, not for creating characters, though. It has generators that allow you... Like, basically, you can go walking down the Silk Road. The whole campaign can be done by generator, right? So if you're going along the Silk Road, you roll every day on the Silk Road, see what encounter you have while you're on the road. When, you reach, when you're reaching a city, you find out what events are in the city. When you're in the city, there are random encounters in the city. There are chances of unwanted attention in the city. There are missions that you can have. Depending on where you go in the city, there are generators for that. If you go to the pleasure house, if you go to, the, to, to a merchant caravan, if you go to talk to a mercenary company, if you go to a, you know, sages of some kind, um, so on and so forth, right? If you're, if you're going to towns, same thing. If you're going to villages, there are, there are generators for generating entire villages. Uh, if you go off-road, you have to get the Wilderlands encounter. Uh, the Wilderlands book, rather. The Wilderlands, um, yeah, Wilderlands, which is random um, wilderness encounters for Sword and Caravan, I think it's called. Um but yeah, so you get all you can you can generate you can generate a ton of your campaign using those tables instead of having to do anything else, right? So in the Gonzo Fantasy Companion, though, is where I have generators for specific like 
characters and, and types of creatures, right? And there's a difference between, there's very simple generators, right? Like roll 3d6 in order is a very simple generator and it doesn't give you a ton of options. Um, but then after that, there are, there are generators that are basic generators and generators that are complex generators. So the mutant hordes, this section of, of the Gonzo Fantasy Companion, which deals with creating mutant characters is an example of a, of a relatively basic generator. So what, if you if you find out that you're playing a mutant, what you would do, and here is the, the trusty um, crawler companion app on my other phone, um, is you would roll, roll, there it is, <laughs> d20, <laughs> trusty. Um, and then you would see on the d20 what, what you got on the main table, right? And here, for example, I rolled an eight, so I got a color mutant. Color mutants are uh, like basically humans that have odd looking colors. And so it says roll, um, roll again and consult the following table on a D10. Since the D10 is already there, it's a 10. That makes it a rainbow mutant. Okay, so when you look down here, it says rainbow mutants are those whose skin tone is like that of a rainbow all across the body, usually in diagonal shapes, but sometimes vertically or horizontally. And there you go. That's your mutant. And there's nothing really special about that one. Let's try one more here, just because this is simple. Okay, another color mutant. Let's try, well, let's let's look at the other result there. 15. What's that? That's a radioactive mutant. So you go look that up, and, you know, you can see there's a wide variety here. Nudist mutants, mud mutants, transparent mutants, vegan mutants, radioactive mutant. Radioactive mutants look like normal humans, but without any body hair and with a light phosphorescent glow. The glow is quite dim, barely enough to illuminate five feet around them in the dark, but still enough that it could make it hard for them to sneak or hide in some cases. Radioactive mutants are immune to twice the levels of radioactivity as humans, but are still vulnerable to high levels of radioactivity. They themselves are lightly radioactive, not enough to cause any immediate harm to beings around them, but enough that someone in near constant proximity for them for a while would probably end up with nasty cancers. <laughs> okay, so that th those are examples of um, the, the, the basic dinner. Now you add to that some other details, because you can also determine if besides that, let's say our rainbow mutant or our radioactive mutant, if they had a random mutation. So this is a D30 roll. I'm going to do that. And where's the D30 result? It's right at the bottom, right? Yeah, 28. Okay. So that's a psychic mutant. All right. That's awesome. Now my, my rainbow mutant is also a psychic. So rainbow mutant, psychic mutants have a number of psychic powers equal to a D3 plus intelligence modifier. We'll determine quickly that his, okay, his intelligence is an 11, so that's zero modifier. And he rolled a D3, that's two. So he gets two psychic powers that are rolled at random as well. So let's start with the D30 there, 21. Uh-oh, here comes Meatball. 21 is resistance. All right. So resistance means that the character can resist extremely harmful environments. Uh, reducing the rate from reducing damage from cold, heat, acid, or energy at a rate of two dice per character level. Uh, he is immune to poison, disease, and radiation. The cost is two points per ten minutes. That's part of how psychic powers work. Is that anytime you activate a psychic power, you draw, you you get temporary con reduction. So there you go. That's resistance. This is the first one that he has. Let's see what his other one is. Meatball is very curious about my die roller there. Uh, that's a ten. A 10 is levitation. Oh, that's a very useful one. All right, so levitation is as per the spell. The character can float up and down in the air. It costs three points for 10 minutes of use. All right, so that is that is this uh, the rainbow mutant. Let's see what the radioactive mutant would have had. All right, so that's again a D30, so that's a 13. And that is hardened skin. Aha, uh -huh. okay. So, uh... Where is that now? Oh no, it's just there, right? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so that just means that he is he is uh, radioactive, and his his skin is um, is toughened um, because that those are those that that mutation doesn't give him anything in particular. It just means that he's going to look weirder. Uh, and then you can even do a roll for random mutant tribal and cultural weirdnesses. So. For example, you roll a d30 here. Now, you don't have to use all of these tables, but you can if you want them. 
So, for example, the radioactive mutant, if he comes from, say, some weird tribe, he might expose himself as a way of saying hello. <laughs> and then, uh, the radioactive mutant, number five there, uh, so he might, if he comes from a particularly weird mutant culture, might say that he believes that obtaining money is a religious obligation and wealth a sign of divine approval. There you are. So that is another, oh no, hardened skin. There it was. I knew I was missing something. Hardened skin, hardened thick skin gives him a plus three to armor class. Okay, so there you are. But he has a minus three penalty to armor checks and one higher die rank for fumbles. There we go. I couldn't find it. I thought, oh, well, it must just be a, a aesthetic, but no, it was at the back page. <laughs> All right. So that is how to do a, a mutant. And that's like, this is a moderate type generator. This, the Gonzo race generator, is a complex generator. And this basically lets a DM create a character race. Okay. Um, so the way this starts is first you, you determine a favored ability, all right? So that is to say an ability score that is the favorite. You start by rolling a d10 here, and that is a two, so that would be dexterity slash agility. Okay, so that means that this race, the first thing we know about this race is that it gets a plus one to dexterity, okay? Unfavored ability. Um, If, if a race has at least one favorite ability, a roll must be made for unfavored ability, okay? And so that's a D8. A D8, I got a 1. So that is either strength, dex, or constitution. It can't be dex, because dex is already the bonus, and that's explicitly explained there. So I'll roll randomly. It is strength. So this is a race that begins with a plus 1 to strength ability score, and a minus 1 to... Uh, sorry, a plus 1 to dex ability score and a minus one to strength ability score, okay? So maybe I should be writing this stuff down so we can figure out the whole the whole thing here. Hang on a sec. Um, plus one dex, minus one strength. All right, next, hit dice. Determine the species basic hit dice. Um, if their favored ability score is strength or constitution, you'd add plus one to the roll plus two if both are favored. If they have minus one, they would have minus one if intelligence is favored, strength is unfavored, or constitution is unfavored. So in this case, strength is unfavored for this race. So I would roll a d6 minus one. So that's a three there. Minus one is two. So that means that his base, the base hit die is a d6 for this race. The hit die can also indicate the general size of a creature. If presenting this as a monster rather than player characters, uh, species, you could also roll 2d10 to determine its paragon hit dice, which would indicate the most, the typical hit dice of the toughest version of this monster under normal circumstances. So this, this generator can be used to be generate, to create races that you can play, that you want, that you can have, let your player, player characters play, or it can create like what are basically monster races, right? So if this was some kind of a, of a, uh, advanced race, not meant for player characters, I could roll 2d10, um, and that would be the, the version of the toughest possible version of that monster, right? Which you could also act as like a maximum level thing in D&D or something like that. So I rolled 2d10, I got an 18. Um, you would divide that by 4 to determine the hit dice for the average member of the species, rounding down. So that would mean that like, if, if this was a monster race we were designing, this would be a, a species where the average one would have 4 hit dice. Probably be some kind of humanoid, right? Um, if the species is giant size, it might be Desiris to roll 3d6 plus 3 instead of 2d10. Um, conversely, if the species is very small, 2d6 might be more appropriate. So this is that's, that's how you work out stuff if you're trying to make it as a monster. Right? If you're trying to make it as a class, you probably want to ignore that. Uh, or as a racial class, right? Um, HDD. When the term HDD is... is used, it refers to hit dice rolled for damage. Um, so for example, when something with H, when something causes HDD for a creature with D8 hit dice, 1D8 damage is rolled. If HDD by by 2 is referenced, then half the hit die type is used rounding up. So this is basically, if a, this is a, basically a section that has been added in the event that your character, that this, that this creature has 
um, natural or special attacks, in which case um, the special or natural attacks will also be derived from the hit die, right? Um, HDS is the difficulty to the saving throw, which would be equal to the type of hit dice plus 10. Um, so, for example, if you need, if you have a, a creature that has a d6 hit die, then the difficulty save would be 16, right? So this is, this is a quick and easy way to create saving throw values and damage values without having to add more stuff, right? Uh, standard movement rate, and so on and so forth. Next, we get to basic species. So, so far what we know is we've got a character that is a race that is dex dexterous, strong, but not strong, and has pretty average hit dice, really, a d6. So, looking at what the basic species would be, we roll a percentage dice, and on the percentage there, we got an 85, and an 85 is human derivative. All right, well, not the most exciting thing in the world compared to some of the options, but let's start with that one for now. Where is human derivative? Oh, did I put that at the back, maybe? Human derivative, all right. So there's a human derivative to refer to the mutant horde section. Otherwise, assume it's a race against the unusual colorations. All right, so let's, let's not do that. Let's instead choose the second option. So that, that would say, basically, if, you're, if you get a human derivative race, it's just a particularly weird mutant race. So let's, the other option here we got is uh, 74. Oh, okay, undead species. That, that, that's pretty weird. That's not bad. Um, so we get here to... Undead species, right? So the undead race reproduces in the standard form that undead do, most likely. But there is a 15% 50 per, chance that it is only a pseudo-undead species. So let's see if that's the case. It is not. Okay, but if it was, then it would actually be a species made from dead matter that somehow reproduces like living matter. The race does not need to eat, to sleep, eat, breathe, or drink. It's immune to ordinary disease, to most poisons. Pseudo-undead suffer undead damage from holy water, however and each species possesses 1d4 additional abilities. So we roll to see which, how many abilities it has and which ones this particular species has. So it has only one, because I rolled a one on the d4 there. And then on the d10, I'm getting an eight there. And the one that they have is terrifying appearance. So this creature takes a, has a minus two penalty to charisma, unless, it is, uh, unless charisma was favored, it was not. So now we're at plus one dex, minus one strength, Minus two charisma. Um, hideous to most other races, bonuses should be granted to intimidation checks and penalties to any reaction rolls based on physical beauty. All right, so that's not a super exciting race, but let's try one more now, now that you've understood the basic concept here, and we'll see what we get. So um, let's see if it has, first of all, a favorite ability score. Let's see how fast we do this. This is uh, starting at 1820. All right, so... Uh, that is a three, so that's Constitution Stamina is favored ability score, plus one con. All right. Unfavored. That's a D8 there. That's a six. None. No unfavored. So, so far as a race, it starts with a plus one to con and no disadvantage. And then you roll again here. Uh, its favorite ability is Constitution, so you added a plus one to the D6 roll. That's only a two, though. That's still a D6, so... This is a race that starts with plus one constitution and has one d6 for hit dice. Roll for your basic species. That's a 38%. Oh, an energy being, all right. <laughs> well, that's interesting, a high con energy being. I think that might end up just making the, con, the high con thing less relevant, but let's see. Um, energy beings, this being is made entirely of energy. Roll on the table below to determine its form. D3, so. Number one, floating blob of light. So there's a floating blob of light race. Um, the first two forms are intangible under normal conditions, only capable of being harmed by energy and magic, barring special abilities, but also incapable of manipulating objects. There's a 30% chance they might be able to manipulate objects when maintaining concentration. And that's a five, so yes. Okay, so this is a race that is intangible, an energy blob, 
can manipulate with concentration. All right. Uh, all three types require are Im completely immune to poison and disease, require no food or air. The species has 1d4 minus 1 additional abilities. We're on the for following table for each of those extra abilities. Let's see if it's got any. Oh, 4, so minus 1, that's 3. D8, that's a 6. And the first one is superheated. Contact with the energy being inflicts damage equal to its HDD. So that means that, that they do a d6 damage if if someone touches them and it's and it's heat damage all right so that's number that's the first one Let's see what the second special ability is for radioactive all right so anyone standing within melee range of the being automatically suffers 1d4 damage each round so if you get even close to it, you're doing a d4 damage if you if you, it touches you or you touch it you do a d you take a d6 damage plus you're next to it so that's another d4 and let's see what the third one is that's a three. Immune to energy. All right, so this entity takes no damage from electricity and non-magical energy weapons, except ion guns, which do double damage. So there you go. That's, a, that's a, an energy being. And as you can see, there's a wide variety of other archetypes of races, right? Fungus man, giant race, demi-human, lizard man, mimic kind. Um, you can have a mimic vegetable. <laughs> you can have all kinds of stuff. Short race demi humans, right? So, like, there's the cute demi human, the quick, oh, by the way, that was 21, 30. So, that was like less than three minutes we generated that race, right? Um, you got your undead species, as we mentioned before, underwater species, wuss species, <laughs> human derivatives. And then in addition to all the, the, the species-specific powers, there's a 60% chance any given race would have 1d3 special powers or vulnerabilities. So we roll, let's say for this energy being, that's a 49%, so it, it does have, in fact, additional powers. Uh, one on the d3, so that's a special, one special power, and we got a seven on the d20 there. So that is detecting secret doors. The energy being has a plus two bonus to perception checks for detecting secret doors. Um, let's see what our undead guy would have done. Um, so that was 98. So no, he does not. <laughs> the guy's a loser. <laughs> I like the energy being better. We actually had an energy being in our, in our DCC campaign. It was quite interesting. Uh, you can also then proceed if you're continuing to make it like as a full race, you want to determine whether the species can, can spell cast, right? In the world of the last sun, only, only the pure strain races, which are humans, uh, and dwarves, um, that can cast clerical magic. None of the other new races would be able to cast as clerics. If your own campaign allows for other races, you could assume other races could become clerics, barring those without gods or conception of gods. And maybe plant men or fungus men can only be druids. For arcane casting, any race that is cybernetic, robotic, otherwise technological or artificial would be unable to be wizards. All other races have a 60% chance of allowing for wizards and a penalty or bonus equal to 10% per point of intelligence modifier with which that race starts. So let's see if our blob person can cast magic. That'd be very helpful to him. Yes, 35%. Okay, so the blob people can, can be wizards if they so choose, right? <laughs> um, and uh, let's see if the undead guy can do it. Oh, he can too. All right. That's not that's not too bad unless you, you think well no there are undead casters so you definitely you definitely could yeah uh, then you could check for the preferred types of weapon and armor so in your game you typically respect species for weapon and armor right and uh, races that have natural armor of some kind shouldn't have any type of preferred warm and armor there's a seventy five percent chance that they may have um, a preferred shield. Uh, unless it's a very pacifistic race or one without regular human hands, in which case it's only 20%. All other races can roll in the following table with a minus 20 if very pacifistic, primitive, or weak, or cowardly, or plus 20 if very warlike or aggressive. So mine are neater, so let's roll the two percentage here. The energy being got a 64, that means it could wear, in theory, plate mail or less. Of course, it's an energy being, so it would only be able to do that if it was concentrating. It wouldn't be especially practical, right? <laughs> so I would probably judge, as the DM, that the blob energy being probably shouldn't get to, to wear armor, right? Like, shouldn't have that as preferred. They could, they could still do it, but they, they wouldn't be, uh, you know, uh, proficient in it. Uh, meanwhile, the undead guy got a 27, which means he can wear only leather height or shields. Maybe he has a, a lack of affinity towards iron, right? Or to metals. 
Uh, weapons. Racists with no limbs. Okay, there goes the blob guy. Or incapable of touching material objects have no preferred weapons. Those from very high-tech cultures use energy weapons like blasters, lasers, plasma. That's their preferred weapon, unless they're pacifists. High-tech and warlike races use all regular weapons. If applicable, roll on the following table. Um, modifying the roll by plus or minus 10% if strength, dexterity, or intelligence are, um, are a modifier. Um, minus 10 if they have some kind of natural lethal damage, so that would be minus 10 for the for the energy blob, minus 20 if they're pacifistic, plus 20 if they're warlike, minus 40 if they lack opposable thumbs. All right, so that would be a minus 50 for the blob guy. He got a 15 in the end, so I mean, he could theoretically still have dagger, cl club, staff, or sling in theory. Though, though I would say that the blob would count as incapable because he only has to, you know, can only touch material things if he concentrates. So I doubt that would be enough for him to be like trained in it, right? Let's look at the undead guy. He would have um, no lethal damage. He's not especially pacifistic, weak, or cowardly, um, but he does have a penalty to strength. Um, so that would give him a minus 10, but he does have a plus 10 to dexterity, so that would cancel it out. And he rolls a 41, which means that he can use dagger, club, staff, spear, javelin, sling, bow, axe, and short sword. And the one thing I don't put in here is like level limits, right? Because in, in DCC, everybody can get to level 10, which is what the World of the Last Sun and the Gone Fantasy Companion was made for. And in other games, level limits sometimes exist and sometimes don't. But I would say that you could use, uh, again, you could use the the Paragon HDD uh, as the level limit, right? So, like, I, the one we rolled at the beginning there could have been for the undead species, and it would have, like, uh, 18. Okay, so its maximum level is 18, right? And this way you can craft an entire class, an entire racial class, let's say, uh, or or a race, right? Because then you could decide if it, you know, like when uh, things like determining spell casting and favored weapons and armor would also determine if you're using it as race as class, then if it can do spell casting, it probably does do spell casting, right? Um, whereas if you're using a race class combo, like, like say, um, I used in my last Sun campaign, even though usually DCC is not that, it's usually race as class. But in my last Sun campaign, if you're an elf or a dwarf, you can choose to be an elf elf, or you can choose to be an elf warrior, or you can choose to be an elf wizard or whatever, right? Uh, so um, in those kind of games, then it's it's not really relevant about the class limit at all, right? So anyways, these that is an example of a complex uh, generator, because it means that you can make... And the variety that, that's there is really enormous. And there's another one I'll show you guys sometimes too when, it, when, when we get in, when we get into really weird territory, which is the talking animals, right? So if you want to play an animal PC. Though I guess playing like a, a talking cat is not actually any... Talking, talking cat here. <laughs> talking cat is not any weirder than, than playing a blob of energy, I suppose, or a walking undead. But uh, there you are. So there's a time and a place to play weirdo races, and that's Gonzo. In Gonzo Fantasy, that's where it's good, where it's funny, where everyone understands that it's ridiculous and silly, right? The place that it's not is when you're trying to do, like, some kind of dramatic, mythic, heroic thing, and everybody's doing a little fashion show about their their completely superficial weirdness as a substitute for playing an actual character, right? That's not what it's for. Gonzo weirdness in characters is for amusement, not as a st statement of identity. All right, that's everything. On that note, that's everything for today. Thank you very much. Please share this video any anywhere you think people find it interesting. Hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't subscribed, and check out all of my products, the links to all of them that are out already. Baptism of Fire is going to have to wait a few weeks. Um, is in the description below. You especially should check out my latest product in the uh, Red Room store. The link is down there in the Pundit Files. Pundit Files number eight is Magic of the Kunlun Mountains, which has a collection of uh, 20 different rituals you can use in any OSR game that are all derived from real historic Tibetan wizardry. Okay, so be sure to check that out. Check out all the other issues of Pundit Presents and check out the Red Room store and uh, take a look at all my other products, especially the Gonzo Fantasy Companion. There is tons of material in there that you're going to find useful if you're a DM, 
if you and, and it doesn't have to be, you know, it's, it, there's nothing in it that obliges it to be for the last sun, right? Like as you see, I give, I explain if you're not running last sun, you can do this instead, right, or something like that. Um, so there's there's tons of stuff there that you can apply to any fantasy campaign when you want it to get a little weirder, you know. Uh, be sure to check that out. Check out Star Adventure too, and check out uh, Sword and Caravan. And uh, that's everything. Currently smoking. This is a um, Lorenzetti Half Volcano plus Argento Natural, which I spilled a bit, but that's okay. <laughs>